We're in the final moments now. It's hard for me to imagine, I think back, it's only 48 hours ago that speakers and panelists, many of you here, met together to raise a set of questions that we had, which we'd like to discuss in this two days. Seems like much longer time and much more discussion than that. Uh, Alexander, in his concluding remarks, he said, now we've discussed so many pieces of the puzzle, uh, we need some way to put it all together. Uh, I think that would be beyond us. But I'm reminded of an old story of a child who was given a big jigsaw puzzle uh, with uh, all the pieces scattered, and uh, he had no way of figuring out how to proceed with hundreds and hundreds of pieces to collect it all together until his mother said, turn the pieces over. And when he turned the pieces over, he soon discovered that all the pieces were the, pe were the pieces forming a human face. And once he had the figure of the face in mind, assembling the pieces was only a matter of time. I think the unifying theme for us, for all that we've discussed in the last two days and was so wonderfully summarized for us because we couldn't all attend all the sessions was, there is a human face <laughs> connecting all of these uh, pieces that we've discussed. And it's not just the face of education, uh, it's the face of humanity and the future of humanity. And what was wonderful for me about this conference is how naturally, smoothly, we interfaced, we moved between education, society, economy, peace, culture, recognizing that we're really talking about one thing. We're talking about our youth and we're talking about the future of humanity. In conceiving of this conference now more than a year ago, uh, that we had in mind a context a context which has beautifully come out in the presentations of various speakers and been referred to in so many ways that we know so well. A context that presents challenges, threats, anxiety, uncertainty, as well as unprecedented opportunities. One of the insistent themes raised over and over again was the challenge of technology and what is coming with the fourth industrial revolution. And it's clear to everybody that this is not a challenge we can face just by business as usual. It's going to take uh, significant efforts to respond to it. But we were also reminded continuously by different speakers that employment is not the only challenge. Rising inequality is a challenge. Growing anxiety and disillusionment of our youth, fears of the future, social instability, tensions uh, in the, uh, about our political systems, a retreat from democracy, and overriding all of them, this threat, this black cloud of existential climate change. And no matter how small was the issue we were discussing in the last two days, and we discussed many issues of great interest and importance in themselves, but always they were in this context of unprecedented changes going on in society, which made everything we're discussing of unprecedented importance. Because I think we all agreed that regardless of what the challenges are, that it, when we trace it back, the solutions, it unavoidably brings us back not to look for simplified technological solutions, somebody to come to the rescue, but ultimately education is one of the central pillars of what we have today, and change in education is one of the fundamental priorities 
for what we need to do to face the future and convert these challenges into the unprecedented opportunities which they surely can be. And that means no matter how exciting or interesting or meaningful in themselves the individual pieces of the puzzle, we simply can't get lost among the trees. We have to remember that there's an ultimate goal out there. It's got the human face on it. It's got the future of humanity. And education and educators and our educational institutions, whether they're formal or informal, public or private, uh, are going to be a critical determining feature of how we go through this period of uncertainty and where we end up at the end. I think it was a wonderful weaving of themes that we went back and forth from the, micro, mi the macrocosm to the microcosm, uh, to the positive opportunities, to the challenges, and it did all, if not a crossword or a jigsaw puzzle, it, it was all part of a single fabric, a, a very human fabric, a very live fabric, not some flat mechanistic idea of some system we're going to create for the future, but something that integrates human aspirations, human values, human potential with the challenges of a complex global society. It's interesting, I reviewed some of the questions that were raised two nights ago, and I couldn't find any of them that we haven't discussed. Uh, any of the ones that were raised when we met two nights ago for the chat, uh, we've covered, we haven't answered any of them in, uh, comprehensively, of course, but I don't think any of them were left out of the discussions and the structure of the themes which uh, uh, our organizers here have framed so intelligently to really form parts of a bigger picture. And I think apart from these themes, apart from these questions like the info glut and how do we deal with excess information or the, the rapid speed of change or the disruptive combination, uh, combinatory in, innovations of IR, of the fourth industrial revolution or the disciplinary silos or anything else. I think that something has emerged very important because we get a picture of the change and the magnitude of the change that's necessary not only in the content, but especially in the pedagogy, in the way in which we learn and future generations learn. And I, I hope it's clear, it's clear to me, I hope it's clear to all from the presentations that the change we need is not incremental. The change we need is really, uh, really, it's a transformation. And we all know that an institution that traces back its roots to the time of Confucius or before uh, and has such deep roots in the past is not going to change overnight and it's not going to change easily, uh, but it can change. This is the most enlightened institutions we have in humanity, not our government institutions. Uh, this is the place if we're, we're going to show to the future. This is where leadership really begins. I think it's also clear that education alone is not the solution to any, to these challenges. Education is one key component of a wider strategy and many of you discuss the economic and economic, the ecological and economic and social and cultural dimensions of the issue. We have to find a way to piece it all together. And this has been of great help and relevance to the World Academy of Art and Science and fulfills, uh, certainly uh, uh, fulfills an aspiration of mine for this conference because as I think I briefly mentioned in my opening remarks and I will elaborate on tomorrow among all of you who would like to join us, uh, we are just at the beginning of launching a new project with the United Nations in Geneva which we call global leadership in the 21st century for want of a, a better term. And it's really about 
How do we affect rapid radical social transformation? Not just in education, but in our economic system, in our financial system, in our political system, in our social systems. There's no institution in society today that says we've got the, we're okay as we are, everybody else should change. We all have to change, humanity has to change, our global system has to change, our international institutions have to change. So we're not picking on anybody. <laughs> we're saying we're all in this together and we all win or, or we all lose if we don't do it. But I think it's come out very nicely that the challenge is how do we lead ourselves because there's nobody to lead us and there's nobody in charge. How are we going to lead ourselves into the future and move rapidly, much more rapidly and with greater clarity than we have up until now? I've, uh, over the last few years, uh, in different conversations, the thought has come up about what's the impact of climate change on uh, humanity. And uh, at one point or another, the thought has occurred to me, and I'm sure to others as well, that if there warrant a real climate existential crisis, we'd need to invent one because we need it. Because nothing less than that overbearing weight of it seems to be enough, and even that doesn't seem to be enough, to unite us to move together to the next stage of global social evolution. We need a challenge like that. And it also occurs to me, since there was a lot of emphasis in this meeting on the threats from technology and the problems that could come from the fourth industrial revolution, that if there wasn't a fourth industrial revolution coming on, that we should probably invent that too. And to think of it in the most positive way, not because it's going to replace human beings, but because it helps us to define and ask ourselves, what does it really mean to be human? We don't, most of us, mourn the fact today that we're no longer plowing the fields by hand, even in countries, developing countries like India. Uh, uh, nobody's sorry that the tractor has replaced the human being in physically plowing or that things we used to do by hand in my grandmother's generation when the washing machine was first invented in the US. Uh, uh, nobody's sorry that we don't wash clothes by hand anymore or grind the, the food in India by hand anymore, or any of these things. It liberates us from the, the past, the, the physical drudgery of being human, of survival, to, it gives us an opportunity to really develop what is unique about us, where we're not just to be compared with how many men are equivalent to how many horsepower uh, for pulling a load or, uh, or uh, uh, moving things, but we can do that which makes us really unique. And to do that, it's not enough that we say, well, machines are going to eliminate a lot of the jobs that we have and we're thinking about an educational system that's going to somehow enable us to compete with the machines? Or is it going to be an educational system that enables us to do what no machine can do, which is to be a human being? A few months ago, Rudolfo Fiorini and I were, and a, a, a larger group of us, uh, Carlos and uh, others here, uh, Alberto and others, we participated in a meeting of IEEE on cognitive computing and artificial intelligence. And we went in, I must confess, I went into that meeting a little defensively uh, in order with the idea that the, those who were developing the, the cognitive computing and artificial intelligence were going to assert the coming triumph of the machine and the completely disposable uh, irrelevance of the human being. And it was very heartening to hear the cognitive computing experts laughing at the idea that machines will ever, uh, uh, will ever acquire what is the consciousness and the intelligence of human beings. So if there's a problem, it's not with the machines taking over for us, 
it's for, uh, for us forgetting what is really the essence of our humanity and our potential. And who's going to remind us of that if it's not our educators? Who's going to remind us of the future we have and the future evolution we have if it's not done in our educational system? So, in closing, I'd like to say a few things. One, I'd like to invite all of you to join us in the work of the World Academy and the World University Consortium in continuing these discussions, in preparing for a, a, a global consultation on how do we develop that leadership in the future. I have a few specific requests apart from please join us for the meetings if you're available, which Nabosha mentioned. Uh, send us copies of your presentations from this. Uh, I know Nabosha is planning a, a publication for this, but in addition to that, we'd like to host them and make them available on uh, our websites. Uh, we have a journal, two journals, Cadmus Journal and Eruditio. Please, if you have articles, you'd like to contribute articles on these themes, we'd be very interested to receive them and, and publish as many as we can in our upcoming journals. You can see cadmusjournal.org, uh, worldacademy.org for, for the other, for Eruditio. Uh, if you're interested in knowing and being in touch with the Academy, please send us your mailing list if, if you're not, send us your address if you're not already on the mailing list to support at worldacademy.org. Uh, and I must now thank uh, again uh, the organizers and those here who have done so much to make this conference possible and wonderful for all of us, uh, Vladimir Kostic and the Serbian Academy of Sciences, for, who's been our host here. <laughs> Alexander Vladovic from the Serbian the Economics Association, where we will be, who's been an important supporter of this and we'll be meeting there tomorrow. Dragon, <laughs> Dragon Durasin, who's been from the very beginning uh, working so closely with us in partnership on the design and implementation of the conference, and we couldn't have done anything without you. Thank you. And Ivanka Popovich from the university, uh, from uh, uh, Belgrade University, and uh, we are grateful for the participation of, of faculty from the university, and we hope and look forward to a partnership with you in future. Our very good friend who just celebrated his birthday a few days ago on Saturday, Sunday, right? On Sunday, Nabosha Neskovic, who's really surpassed our, all our expectations. Thank you, Nabosha. <laughs> and finally, all of you from near and far who have come and given so much and shared so much with us because it's really you, it's you and all of us together that have made this conference. And I think uh, I'm very proud to have been associated with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>